Last Sunday, when St. Luke introduced John the Baptist, we learned that he was from the priestly family. Zechariah was a priest in the temple. Although the description of John's clothing comes from the Gospel of Matthew, this rather famous painting by El Greco uh, pictures John the Baptist as somewhat of a wild man, not the kind of clothing you would expect to find somebody dignified, a priest of the temple wearing. John's not in the temple. He's out in the wilderness. And in fact, his teaching is almost anti-establishment. The directive, if anybody has two cloaks, they should give one to one who has none. The, actually, it was the undergarment, the tunic that was worn under the cloak. And people had two, one for every day and one for the Sabbath day. But John seems to be saying that compassion... Generosity to the poor is more important and outweighs the practice of religion. John is always pointing away from himself, getting ready to get out of the way himself. I'm baptizing you with water, but one mightier than I is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John recognizes that his water baptism is just a container. He can't fill it with Holy Spirit and fire. Only the one coming can do that. Only the one coming can can fill us with the fire of God's love. In the liturgy, we celebrate the feast of John the Baptist on June the 24th, just uh, six months before Christmas, at the time of the summer solstice. Because in the Gospel of John... John says, he must increase and I must decrease. So from the time of the summer solstice, when the day is the longest day of the year, from that time on, the days get shorter and shorter until we get to Christmas, to the winter solstice and the birth of the light of the world. So like the moon, John is reflecting somebody else's light. I found this little verse this summer for the Feast of John the Baptist. The moon with borrowed light gives witness to the sun, discreetly fading with the night when morning has begun. Another wilderness figure that we met this week, December the 9th, Juan Diego, was walking on the hills of Tepeyac in Mexico when Our Lady appeared to him and told him to go to the bishop and to tell the bishop to build a shrine to Mary on the hill at Tepeyac. Of course, the bishop was not interested in listening to Juan Diego, a recent convert to Christianity, and he tried to avoid the lady, but she found him again. And the bishop had demanded a sign, and so she told Juan Diego to pick roses that were growing there on the hillside in December. And it turns out they weren't even roses native to Mexico. They are roses native to Spain, and there they were. He put them in his cloak, in his tilma, and when he went to the bishop and opened the tilma, there was the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is still existent today. The golden rays from the sun behind her signify that she's the mother of light and greater than the Aztec sun god whom she eclipses. The Virgin stands on a crescent moon. The Aztec word for Mexico, Mexico, means in the center of the moon. The moon also symbolizes the Aztec moon god, fertility, birth, and life. Mary's rose-tinted flowery tunic symbolizes the earth, while her turquoise starry mantle represents the heavens. The mantle also indicates that she is royalty, since only the native emperors wore cloaks of that color. The stars on her cloak are the same constellation as the night sky, December 12th, 1531. With her dark complexion and mixture of indigenous and Spanish features, Our Lady of Guadalupe represents the unity of all people. She gazes downward with tenderness, loving expression of a mother gazing at her child. And she spoke to Juan Diego, not in Castilian Spanish, but in his native Nahuatl language. She spoke the language 
of the powerless, the disenfranchised, the outcast. Her message to the bishop was that God's church should be built out on the fringes of society, amidst the poor and the downtrodden. We're hearing that call echoed quite often from Pope Francis. Francis, in calling for this year of mercy, said that today we need a revolution in tenderness because justice and all the rest come from it. We have to cultivate the revolution of tenderness today, the tenderness of God towards each one of us as a fruit of this year of mercy. These Advent guides, John the Baptist, Juan Diego, Our Lady of Guadalupe, are the ones who point the way to the Christ who is in our midst. They appear not in places of power, but rather in the wilderness, but they're called to speak truth to power. My favorite image this week was the Archbishop of Indianapolis, Joe Tobin, who's actually from Detroit. He went to grade school and high school at Holy Redeemer in Detroit. He's now the Archbishop of Indianapolis. Uh, Here he is with uh, Governor Pence, the governor of Indiana. Governor Pence, like uh, Governor Snyder, uh, ordered that there would be no Syrian refugees allowed in the state of Indiana. But Archbishop Tobin decided to settle a Syrian refugee family anyway. And this past Monday night, uh, parents with two children uh, took residence in Indianapolis where the local Catholic charity agency will assist them. You'll remember when Pope Francis was here, after he spoke in the halls of power to Congress, he went out to the streets and had lunch with the homeless in Washington, D.C. All these figures are people not pointing to themselves, but to God. It's not what they have accomplished, but what God has done in them. As Zephaniah said so powerfully, do not fear, O Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. Those are powerful words and wonderful words. But when we imagine being renewed by God's love, all I can think of is the image that John the Baptist gave us the image of fire and the Holy Spirit. The word fire actually appeared in today's gospel three times in just 12 verses, and fire is only mentioned four other times in the entire gospel of Luke. Usually when we think of fire, we think of something that's painful. But this is a transformative process. We have to let something go in order to let God in. St. John of the Cross, I think, gives a wonderful insight into this transformative power of fire. He says that the early stages of our spiritual life were like the damp log that's thrown on the fire. Before the fire can claim the wood for itself, it must first dry out the log. The whole of the spiritual life can be seen as preparation for the soul to receive more deeply the love of God. And in the same way that a dry log catches fire more easily than a wet one, so the soul responds more immediately to the impulse of God the more prepared it is by the Holy Spirit. This process of drying, of course, is something we resist at first, but we soon recognize its benefit in producing in us a greater conformity to God. We become more united to God's action within us. And lastly, the log becomes one with the fire. In this way, the wood loses its own properties and acquires the properties belonging to the fire. Once it is dry, it dries other things. It acquires the heat of the fire, and then it produces heat itself. It takes on the bright flame from the fire and then reflects that light itself. This is all performed by the properties of the fire. Now that the log has been conformed to them, John of the Cross called this transformation the dark night of the soul. This is Good Friday work on our way to Easter. 
Or as Edna St. Vincent Millay put it in another way, but in the end it's still the same of letting go and letting God, she wrote, My candle burns at both ends. It will not last the night. But ah, my foes and oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. <laughs>